I'm Jill walker Retberg, a Professor of Digital Culture at the University of Bergen. I lead an ERC-funded project on machine vision. So that's things like this. This is actually an ad made by Tesla to show how their self-driving cars uh, see the world. You can see on the right-hand side of the screen, it shows what the computer is seeing. Um, and in the middle, we see the human driver's uh, viewpoint. So what we're seeing here is how the machine, the camera vision in a self-driving car picks out elements of the world, right? It identifies a car that's passing, markings on the road and so forth. This is a different way from seeing than human vision. And what my project is trying to do is figure out how this is impacting us. Is this changing the way we humans see the world when we see with computers? Here's the project full title. And these are some of the kinds of machine vision we're looking at. Facial recognition, for instance, emotion recognition. So this is how computers are designed to either recognize a person's face and identify them. Well, this is Jill walker Redberg's face. Or to recognize our emotions. Um, is someone smiling? Then does that mean they're happy? Also body scans, medical scans, image generations and deep fakes, cameras that are um, in other places or self-automated. So Google Lens is a free app you can download to see some of how machine vision works. For instance, if I show Google Lens, I can, I can ask Google Lens to search by image. And if you point it at a picture of a cat, it will um, identify the image as a cat and it suggests a few different kinds of cat it could be. Um, so that works pretty well, right? Great image recognition. You can search by images. However, artificial intelligence and the machine learning algorithms that um, that run these uh, image recognitions are biased. As you can see from this, this is Google Photos. So um, the person in the bottom, in the, in the middle of the bottom frame there, uploaded this selfie of herself and a friend to Google Photos. Now Google Photos, like your phone probably does, actually sorts images into different categories. And you can see it's correctly sorted many of her images, cars, a graduation ceremony, a bike, but it has classified the image of this young woman as a gorilla. That's not just an incorrect classification. It's a racist trope that has existed in our culture for centuries, and it's a very damaging uh, stereotype. Now, Google's response with this um, was actually just to delete gorillas from their image recognition. If you point your Google Lens app at a picture of a gorilla today, it finds no results. You should go ahead and try that after this lecture, by the way. Um, they were not able to find a way to correctly identify dark-skinned people of African heritage as humans. So what does that say about how computers read faces? Well, it's deeply concerning. To understand how this is working, let's just try to look at how neural networks and machine learning work. So this is a very simple um, basic understanding of how it works. Um, first, you have to feed the uh, system a, a tag data set. There's other kinds of learning, but this is the most common. You take a set of pictures and they're tagged. For instance, this is a cat, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is guacamole, this is an apple, etc. Or your data set might have different tags. It might say, for instance, this is a man, this is a woman, this is somebody smiling. So you take this big data set of many, many images and you feed it into a neural network. Now, an, a neural network is a machine learning um, system that is based on the idea you have these different layers and different nodes, which actually each of the nodes identifies a different aspect of the image. So maybe one little node is saying, okay, I see a curve. Another one is saying, I see these colors. And then it picks out it, so it, it divides all the images into these um, individual aspects and then it sees oh okay we see more of these sort of things if it's a cat and more of these sort of things if it's a dog and then it makes predictions after that so you can feed new images into the neural network and it's learned from the data set so it can predict what a new image is of and so on the right hand side you see here an image of a cat and it's predicted correctly that this is a tabby cat um, it has a few other ideas. It has levels of certainty, so it's a bit more than 80% certain that this is actually a cat. 
This gets more problematic when you're trying to tag humans. Um, and one of the most common problems with biased data sets is that you have a, a data set which is not representative. So for instance, you have a lot of pictures of white men. And that's a problem with Google Photos, for instance, and most um, facial recognition systems because they're developed often in, um, in California and most of the people working in the companies that develop them are white men. And so you end up with this very undiverse uh, data set. You run it through the same machine learning, the same kind of neural network, and the predictions it comes up with is that, oh, this African-American woman must be a gorilla because she doesn't look like those white men. Or Serena Williams is male. Joy Buellamwini at the MIT Media Lab um, really raised attention to this. She's a researcher there, and she discovered this problem when she was uh, not recognized by her Xbox, which also uses image recognition and facial recognition to say, oh, there's a human here. You know, the Xbox lets you interact with it through the camera, so you use gestures. But in order to interact with your Xbox using that system, you actually, your Kinect, sorry, um, it needs to see a human, and it does that by identifying a human face. Um, that's a problem if you have dark skin and the algorithm doesn't see you as human. So Joy Bolanwini and her team um, in the Gender Shades project went through, um, they audited many different uh, facial recognition systems and they found, as you can see here, that most of them um, are really pretty good at recognizing uh, light-skinned men. Um, they're not quite as good at re recognizing white-skinned women, but pretty good. Um, Dark-skinned females, they're terrible at recognizing them. After this, the, um, the companies have improved their data sets because a lot of this can be solved by simply having a more diverse data set in the first place. However, it's still a problem. This becomes a huge problem if you think about what facial recognition is used for. It's not just for playing games, it's also for entering buildings, it's also for identifying criminals or worst case scenario um, with uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems, facial recognition can be used to identify a target for an assassination in a war. That's a pretty, um, a pretty high risk if there is, you know, a 30% risk of killing the wrong person. Um, so I'd like you to watch this video, which is, uh, let me see, by Joy Boylan because it's a poetic response to what this means. I'm going to let you watch this video in your own time. Have you come back again? So I hope you actually watched that video before continuing uh, this lecture. Uh, I'd like to just explain what actually happened in that video by Joy Bulanwini. Uh, so they had a data set that was tagged much in the same way as we saw earlier. Um, but in this case, the tagging is more specific. It's about emotions um, that runs through the machine learning and then it makes predictions. I hope you actually watched that YouTube video. I'd love you to go back and watch it if you haven't. So Joy Bulanwini's um, poem shows how, how uh, emotion recognition, how, how facial recognition can have really deep emotional impact and cultural impact as well on people. Here's another example, emotion recognition. Now, what this does is it tries to, it, it plots what your expression is on your face and it uh, imagines, it, it predicts then what your emotion is. And these are used, for instance, in schools in China, where, for instance, you, and Australia, I believe, where you have, um, it, it reads the faces of all the students in the room and the ones that are not paying attention or are smiling or looking tired are marked as having, you know, spent 7% of the time uh, not paying attention or looking unhappy. And messages are actually sent to their parents based on this. You can imagine many other uses for this. One of the most common commercial uses is uh, they have people watching videos, advertisements, for instance, and then this uh, system will track whether people look excited or happy about the advertisement, and the advertiser uses that in order to um, analyze the um, to, to figure out how to make a better advertisement. Now, the basic problem here is not just 
not so much the problems with the data set itself, but the problem is that the face is a proxy for emotion. That means when you measure expressions on the face, you're not actually measuring how somebody feels. You're just, ma imagine, you're just measuring what their face looks like. And in this um, article by Barrett et al., a group of um, prominent psychologists, they go through so, uh, like hundreds of different psychological surveys looking at whether there is a connection between emotions and facial expressions and they find that there is not emotion is so connected to context to other things beyond just facial expression that you actually cannot measure some how somebody feels based on what their face looks like and you can imagine some problems with using this kind of system. You could imagine a dictator, for instance, who installs emotion recognition everywhere. And while the dictator is giving a speech, everyone needs to smile and look respectful. And if they don't, then you might be thrown into jail for thought crimes, right? Yes, I have read 1984. Um, the thing is, if these systems did um, evolve, we would probably end up with poker faces. Can you imagine a society where no one dares to show their true emotions because the computers might be watching? AI also controls other kinds of recommendation, of course. It's not just about image recognition and faces. So this is what my YouTube uh, on my iPad looks like because my uh, nine-year-old uh, uses it. He obviously likes, you know, Minecraft and so forth. And YouTube is offering more of that to him. Um, this can go badly. We, there is some research showing that YouTube's recommendation algorithms tend to recommend more extreme content. So, for instance, if you have, um, if you're doing a search for, you know, um, immigration, you might quite fast end up in a very right-wing anti-immigrant or fascist uh, recommendation sort of ecosystem. Or if you're interested in veganism, maybe, sorry, in vegetarianism, maybe you end up being a vegan or being recommended that. And this is also how conspiracy theories happen. Now here the problem with the algorithm isn't that it's not learning what you like to watch. It's that it's, 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 it's programmed to generate profit for YouTube, and profit for YouTube happens from when you um, when you watch more ads, when you spend more time watching videos. So they look at, for instance, you know, did she stop watching the videos? Um, did she not watch the whole of it? Um, they're really just trying to give you more content that will keep you on YouTube for longer, so you see more ads. It turns out we spend longer on YouTube if we're outraged or angry or upset. And so the algorithm learns to give us more videos that will make us upset or angry or outraged. And that's not really what we want from our media, is it? You've also got lethal um, autonomous weapon systems, which I already mentioned. And then there's a the problem that we're really um, creating this society where we're just gathering more and more data. So we're bringing up our children to expect continuous surveillance, which is translated to machine readable data. This is uh, several years old, 2009, but it's like an excerpt from one of the uh, high, uh, high school sort of uh, system tracking when people, you know, bad behavior. And you see, this is when I went to high school, I guess teachers wrote down notes, but it certainly wasn't in a searchable database. Once you put something in a database and turn it into data, it can be used in ways that it would not be used otherwise. So a basic question in digital culture is whether society controls technology or technology controls society. Which way around is it? Now, if we say, if we think that technology is going to cause change in society, so you, you come up with a new technology and society will change, then that's what we call technological determinism. And one of the classic examples of this is the bridges in New York, between New York and Long Island. Now, as you know, Long Island is this beautiful beach island where rich people live. And in the 30s, the city architect designed these bridges. And as you can see, they're very low. A bus can't get through these bridges. And the argument then is that that was a clever way of making technology that causes certain societal effects. Because if you can't get a bus through there, you need a private car or a taxi. Poor people can't afford private cars or taxis. And so you keep poor people out of Long Island. Here's another example of technological determinism. Do you remember Paris, revolutions? You've heard, read about this in history. There were many, many revolutions in Paris, and one of the ways that the revolutions were successful was that the streets were narrow, um, and they were able to barricade the streets. Oh, another interesting fact. This picture is the first 
news photograph ever printed in a newspaper, 1848, I believe. And um, anyway, Napoleon, one of the Napoleons, decided he did not like these barriers, the barricades that were being built. And so he told the city architect, General Hausmann, to simply get rid of the, the, the small streets and design boulevards. Now, the great thing about boulevards in Paris, I mean, they're beautiful, right? You can also drive tanks through them. And if you can drive tanks through uh, a, a boulevard, well, <laughs> the people don't have much they can do. How are you going to barricade that? And of course, this is also now the way we know Paris, beautiful Paris. So technology does control, it, it certainly can control society and the way we're able to behave, but it's often not intended. For instance, I cannot believe that anyone designed staircases specifically to keep people in wheelchairs out, but it's an unfortunate consequence of them. Another example is analog photography, which was calibrated for white skin. Um, this is a, a Shirley card, which is what analog um, photographers, sorry, the people developing the photographs used to use to calibrate the images. And as you can see, there's no one with dark skin there. In fact, it was almost impossible to take good photos of people with dark skin until the 1970s when Kodak came up with Kodak Gold, which is, was known for actually being good for dark images. Um, and they didn't do this because they wanted to not include people with dark skin in photographs or because they wanted the three dark ch skinned children in the classroom to not show up on the class photo. Um, no, they did it because they didn't think of anything else because they did not have a diverse group of developers or, or you don't call it developers for analog film, do you? But, you know, um, Kodak Gold was not also not introduced in order to solve the bias problem, but in response to advertisers of dark chocolate and mahogany furniture who complained because their advertising images did not show uh, up the, the, the details of their, of their products. So it wasn't even about helping people. So it's not that dissimilar from the bias we see in today's algorithms. Technology can also cause different societal organization. For instance, railways require centralized organization. You need to have a central um, control of where the trains go. You need to invent things like time that can be measured the same way across a nation so you know when the trains are coming and leaving. Nuclear power also requires a very central organization to keep it safe. But, for instance, solar power would work in a decentralized society. So there are clearly ways that society, technology affects society. But obviously, it's society that creates technology too. So we can talk about a co-construction. Now, in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of emphasis on the society um, having the main impact here. So people laughed at the idea of technological determinism and say, no, it's created by culture. And there was a strong idea that, you know, every th things are relative and we, um, we change technology. But in the last years, especially after Facebook and face fake news and just seeing how much technology affects us when it's changing as fast as now, there's a more of an acceptance of this idea that technology does determine society to some idea, to some extent. But perhaps it's not that simple. Donna Haraway, great feminist scholar, um, she wrote the Cyborg Manifesto where she says, you know, forget about these binaries. It's not nature versus culture, man versus woman, technology versus society. It's all mixed up. We're cyborgs. And she means cyborgs as a metaphor for understanding that we... Um, humans are not just nature and bodies. We are also technology. We integrate it in ourselves. We use it. I have contact lenses. Um, you may have other technologies you're using. Well, just the way we work with our computers and phones is pretty cyborgian. And there are newer theories too, like um, vital materialism, new materialism. Um, Jane Bennett wrote a book, Vibrant Matter, and she talks about the blackouts that happened in America um, in 2000, oh, I don't remember, three or something like that. There have been many of those, um, where you can't pinpoint an individual cause. There's not one reason why that blackout happened. Um, and she talks about this idea of the assemblage. Many people, many scholars have talked about assemblages. Bruno Latour, the posthumanists, 
um, Jane Bennett, the, the new materialists, feminist materialists. The idea of the assemblage is that it's not technology versus society. It's a mixture. It's an assemblage, a putting together of many different things. And this list of the things that caused the blackouts in, um, in the United States is a beautiful example of an assemblage. The electrical grid is better understood as a volatile mix of coal, sweat, electromagnetic fields, computer programs, electron streams, profit motives, heat, lifestyles, nuclear fuel, plastic, fantasies of mastery, static, legislation, water, economic theory, wire and wood, to name just some of the actants. Now, the idea of an actant comes from Bruno Latour's actor network theory, also known as ANT, where he's um, showing these networks between different actors. Um, so an actor could be me as a human, but it could also be the law or it could be a computer or an algorithm. So these are useful new ways of understanding the relationship between technology and society. Assemblages in Bennett's definition are ad hoc groupings of diverse elements, vibrant materials, of all sorts. Vib vibrant materials, she means that a material thing, like a cup or a computer, it's a thing, it's not alive, but it can still have this vitalism. It can be vibrant in that it has some kind of agency. It does something with other things. So an assemblage, this, this connection of me and the technologies I use and everything around me, are living, throbbing confederations that are able to function despite the persistent presence of energies that confound them from within. Kate Hales also thinks in this way. She defines cognition as something that's not just a human action. So she says cognition. OK, she talks about the human. She says humans think that's the stuff we're conscious of and we're thinking. We know we think we reflect. But there's also this non-conscious cognition. This isn't a Freudian unconscious subconscious thing. It's a different paradigm. You think but you also have cognition, you cognize. And your cognition is non-conscious. You're not aware of it. It comes before consciousness. Um, it's a process that interprets information within context that connect it with meaning. So for instance, um, right now, my body is uh, a little bit hot and it's producing a little bit of sweat. Um, I'm breathing without being aware of it. And sometimes the uh, responses are more sophisticated. I start to cry without knowing why. Um, and uh, part of that is not at the conscious level. It, this definition of cognition is also interesting because it allows you to understand what computers do as cognition. Because computers and algorithms are processes that interpret information, they take in data, they interpret information within context that connect it with meaning. They um, input data and they interpret it in a certain context and create a form of meeting, meaning. Animals also have cognition, clearly. And there's a lot more to be said about all this, maybe later. So what is data anyway? Because if we're inputting data, what is this data? And that's sort of at the crux of trying to figure out how machines see versus how humans see. Uh, I think this image is a beautiful example of data because these footprints are clearly data of a kind and we can interpret them and we can realize that probably, well, especially when you see the man and the, the person and the dog, um, sure, people have walked here, dogs have walked here, but they could be other things. They're proxies for what really happened and we tend to try to interpret them as, as the thing we really want to get at without really thinking about how they are proxies for something else. There's no such thing as raw data. Order data is situated and created. And so that's something to think about when we're thinking about what the data sets are that we are using. Um, as, I, um, as we talked about the emotions, uh, the facial expressions are proxies for emotion. They're not the emotion itself. Now, dataism is a concept, it's this idea, this almost ideological belief that that if you have data and you're objectively quantifying things, then you can predict anything, and that's power. And this belief in dataism is um, often sets us off on the wrong track, like the emotion recognition scholars who are selling a system that actually is not based on scientific research or on what we actually know about emotion. These systems are being applied in many places, like this school in China, which has made a facial recognition system that scans the student's behavior in class. I mentioned this previously. 
or um, this is actually a, a visualization of what it might look like. I'm not sure the computers actually see this, but um, the social credit system in China where computers use facial recognition to see uh, individuals and connect them to other data about them in the system. They can also do things like uh, tracking your gestures or your behavior. So they can, um, well, in this in this case, I'm not, I think they're just checking if you're buying um, nappies or beer and they're giving you scores accordingly. But there are also systems um, for automated supermarkets where there's gesture recognition systems that uh, see whether you're a risky looking customer. So does it look like you're going to steal something? Um, and the funny thing is the data set that they've taught this system to recognize a potential shoplifter with is not real shoplifters. It's actors. They got a bunch of actors to pretend to be shoplifters. They recorded that on video. And that's the data set that the neural network then learns what a shoplifter looks like. So we don't really know if that's actually what shoplifting looks like. There are also um, risk prediction systems that, are, that have huge impact on people's life. For instance, if you read this article, you'll read about um, two individuals who were uh, convicted for the same crime, stealing an item for a value of about $80. Vernon Prater, on the left here, uh, stole, had, had previous convictions, had spent five years in jail, and had uh, robbed, he, he stole tools from uh, like a Home Depot store in the United States. Um, Brisha Borden was 18. She'd never, ever been convicted of anything. And she was late picking up her niece from school and she saw a kid's bike next to the road and she grabbed it and got on it to ride it. Um, but a neighbor saw her and called the police and she was arrested. And even though she'd thrown the bike away, she was still arrested. Now, when the um, the judge ran, or the, the, the police, or the, sorry, the judge ran this through the risk assessment system to see what the likely risk of them repeating a crime, so the risk of recidivism was, um, the system found that Brisha Borden's risk of repeating a crime or doing, committing another crime was much, much higher than Vernon Prater's. The difference between the two it's that she's black and lives in a black area. He's white. His crimes were clearly worse, you would think. You'd think it was more likely that someone who'd already spent time in jail was going to commit another crime than an 18-year-old never convicted of anything before. But the risk assessment is based on data such as, you know, how many of your friends have ever been arrested? How many of your friends and acquaintances served time in jail or prison? Um, have, have, has your parent uh, ever been sent to jail or prison? And in black communities, far more people have actually been in jail than in white communities. So these things have this immense bias in them that are set up to just replicate social problems and inequalities. So what I really want you to remember here is that um, the, the data that is available to you is not real life. Also, you can download this free app and play with it. It's quite fun, Affectiva. These systems are being, um, are being brought into our country, into Norway, into around the world. And um, for instance, the, um, in Norway, they're testing out systems for facial recognition and prediction and risk prediction in uh, police, the police and customs. This is a police prediction system used in the US where based on previous crimes, um, the system r predicts how likely um, there a crime is going to be in a particular neighborhood. So it sends the police to certain neighborhoods based on this risk assessment, which is based on previous crime rates, but also things like um, what the weather's like or whether school's out today. In Chicago, they've taken it even further. They have something called a strategic subject list, li list where they identify individual people who they think are more at risk of joining a gang, or killing somebody, being killed. And then they try to help these individuals, which could go really well with the right um, help, um, but it's also, uh, well, you, there can be problems with the way the police force, especially in the United States, actually deal with individuals. Um, TikTok, it's, it's unclear exactly what TikTok does with data, and this is something that many countries, including the EU and Norway, are trying to figure out. But there are rumors that they use things like um, expression analysis, um, facial um, analysis, what your age is, etc., uh, in order to make predictions and, and recommend you content. So it will be very interesting to find out what all these explorations of what TikTok actually does with data lead to. 
And another problem with this is that you don't know what you're not seeing in social media. So, for instance, this is an example of a post that got an an NRK journalist um, banned from Facebook. Um, Now, she manages an NRK uh, page, but she shared this article here about an increase in measles um, to her private profile on Facebook. And that got the whole NRK page banned, which is a bit problematic since it's, you know, the national broadcaster's page. Um, and if you look at the article she shared, it says that the World Health Organization says there's a 50% increase in measles. It's not fake news. But the picture of the child may have been interpreted as nudity. And that would have been automatically caught up by um, an algorithm because there are algorithms that sort out what it thinks are pornography, for instance, which is sometimes problematic. If you're interested in these questions, um, I invite you to read my book, which um, is not specifically about machine vision, but it's about self-representation in visual media, in blogs and textual media, and also through data. So it has a lot of the ideas that lead to the current project. Um, We've also got a project website. We're building a database. There's going to be lots more coming out um, and even an exhibition at the University Museum in March 2021. Thank you very much.